Thank you all for coming. Welcome to day two of our two day series on movement lawyering. Uh, very excited today to have two incredible speakers with us. Uh, first, we have Danielle Blunt, who is a professional New York City based dominatrix a sex and sex worker rights advocate. She has her master's in public health and researches the intersection of sex work and equitable access to tech. Blunt is one of the co-founders of Hacking Hustling, a collective of sex workers and accomplices working at the intersection of technology and social justice formed in response to SESTA-FOSTA. Blunt is on the advisory board of Berkman Klein's initiative for a representative First Amendment, and she enjoys redistributing money from institutions, watching her community thrive, and making men cry. Uh, we also have Kendra Albert, who is a clinical instructor at the Cyber Law Clinic, where they teach students to practice technology law. They hold a degree from Harvard Law School and serve on the board of the ACLU of Massachusetts. They enjoy redistributing money from institutions, working on their solidarity practice, and making people in power uncomfortable. Uh, so two amazing speakers, and I'm going to turn it over to Kendra to begin the first part of our discussion, which is, oh, sorry, one, one announcement before I do that. Um, You'll notice, uh, since we're in webinar mode, that there's both a Q&A and a chat function. So what we would like you to do uh, is use the Q&A for any questions you have for the panelists. Uh, that'll allow everyone to see the questions you're posing, and you can also upload other people's questions. So if you're, if you're thinking about asking something, you can check to see if someone else has already asked that question, and you can bump it to the top. For everything else, if you want to make a comment, if you want to share a resource, if you uh, want to complain, uh, if you want to complain, you can you can message me personally. Uh, but for everything else, uh, please use the uh, the chat functionality. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Kendra to get started. Awesome, thank you, Mason. I'm super excited to be here and be in conversation with uh, with Blunt. Um, you know, uh, draw, building off Afsana and Yumna's like fantastic introduction to movement lawyering yesterday, I thought it, we kind of, Blunt and I talked about this a little bit in advance, and I think we're, what we're kind of hoping to talk about is like sort of realistically how some, like how conversations around like movement lawyering style relationships might work in practice. And I'm using the example of some of our, our work together. So I figured like we kind of start with what I guess I've been jokingly calling our organizing meet cute, which was like how Blunt and I became connected and started working together. Um, and then, you know, talk a little bit about how we think about our work um, and like some of the stuff that we've done together and, you know, uh, how that fits into the movement lawyering frame um, and how that there may be other frameworks, frameworks to think about it. And then sort of how, what lessons we might be able to learn from some of our work together that we're taking into the future and then like that may be helpful to use. So that's my plan, Blunt, anything you wanna add to that? No, I'm really excited to chat about this and for the opportunity to reflect like this because um, from my perspective, I, it, it wasn't so much as like an intentionality of seeking out movement lawyers so much as um, screaming into the void and Kendra <laughs> responded. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, I retweeted it yesterday, but I, Hacking Hustling was formed in response to SESTA FOSTA and Melissa Jerry Grant and I and some other comrades put on some har like immediate harm reduction programming with IBEAM and um, it was tell at folks what IBEAM is. Yeah, sorry. So IBEAM is like an art in tech organization in Brooklyn that funds some pretty awesome work um, and they had recently done a panel series on like women in tech and sex work was left out of the conversation so we invited them to continue the conversation and this was in our programming there which then turned into the organization that hacking hustling is um and so uh while we were organizing against fosta sesta we were met with this sort of deafening silence from the tech community from tech lawyers from just about everyone other than sex workers um, and very few allies. Uh, so I was researching content moderation and doing as much research as I could because people who I expected to be having these conversations weren't. And I, th I believe it was, um, I was reading Custodians of the Internet and saw that Tarleton was giving a talk at, I think, Berkman Klein. Um, and Kendra just happened to be moderating that conversation. And I like 
raise my hand on Twitter and like tweeted. I didn't even tweet at you. It's just something we were discussing, but I tweeted at Berkman Klein and Tarleton asking about how you can write a book on content moderation and have a whole chapter on section 230 and not ever mention FOSTA SESTA. Um, and Kendra, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about what your response was? Yeah, sure. So I think I asked the question um, yeah. to Tarleton at the, uh, at the session um, and sort of, you know, a little bit of backstory prior to like where sort of that, that moment was that like sex worker rights issues were something I'd been sort of paying attention to kind of in the background for a while. I had read Melissa Gura Grant's um, Playing the Whore, which is an excellent book if folks haven't read it. Um, and uh, like sort of had been roughly following some of the aftermath of FOSTA SESTA and the things that had happened, like the organizing before, um, mostly I think through the lens of EFF sort of using, talking about sex workers and working with sex workers a little bit in their organizing against FOSTA SESTA. So, you know, it came time to like ask that question, right? And so I asked the question and I don't really remember what Talison's response was. Um, but then afterwards I sort of like reached out to Blunt on Twitter and like found the thread and was like, hey, like, I hope I asked it okay. Like I didn't see, there was like a longer bit that Blunt had like a uh, screenshot very verbose. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think I asked quite that. I think I just literally was like, so what about FOSTA SESTA, right? Like, um, but like happy to talk more. Um, and so, you know, then we ended up like, I think having like a phone call um, where I got to hear more about what Hacking Hustle had been doing. And I actually had tried to tune into the IBEAM event, um, but the, I hadn't been quite able to hear it. Um, and sort of we started talking about like what I don't know what next steps look like or felt like for hacking hustling and like how we could be I could like maybe I could be useful and I think one thing to note about those initial conversations is I think I was very much approaching them from like a lawyer frame right like not necessarily that I would take hacking hustling on as a client but like oh like my expertise is as a lawyer right like what I'm bringing to this is my ability to interpret FOSTA SESTA right like um or like my ability to sort of do legal reasoning or whatever um, and that wasn't exactly what, what you were looking for from me. Can you tell me more, tell us more about that? Sure. Yeah, we've been just sort of very frustrated and trying to get in response. And I also want to note that your, your initial response to me made me like very excited to pursue working together, having conversations together, because your response was something like, yes, like, this is really exciting for me. Like, I've been really interested in thinking about FOSA SESTA, but, like, didn't want to do that without input from sex workers. And I was like, great, like an ally, great, amazing. Um, and so we sort of took it from there. I think we had a phone conversation, and then you invited myself and a few other sex workers to Berkman Klein to have a conversation. And what I also remember about that conversation is that it was a group of folks who have access to those institutional spaces who benefit from the privileges of being in, being employed by, or going to Harvard, um, sitting in a room listening to three sex workers sort of scream about how horrible this, this legislation was and like what our fears were and like what we were experiencing in community. And like reflecting on that, it it very much was in alignment with the work that Hacking Hustling had been doing where people who are, people who have power in institutions, like, give that power to are being put in a situation where they first have to listen to the communities who are impacted and who they're purporting to serve. Um, so that, that meeting to me followed the same sort of way that we planned our initial programming at Hacking Hust uh, at IBEAM, which was the first day was a panel of sex workers talking about their experiences with navigating online spaces, losing access to these online spaces. And then it was followed up by a day of, of it, we actually found t for tech like a trans-led organization providing harm reduction materials who also had sex working um, teachers to give the harm reduction digital security trainings, which was actually very cool. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it was really amazing that our first time, like my first time entering the Berkman client space was like people were really interested in listening before like moving into like brainstorming solutions. Yeah, and I think one thing to flag there is we also did sort of think about like what were the next steps and brainstorm some solutions. And there were a couple different things that came out of even that meeting. I think 
uh, there was sort of a harm reduction zine on um, sort of reduce like understanding like financial systems and how platforms track you with an eye towards reducing the chances that folks were getting their financial accounts shut down because that's something that happens for folks who aren't aware to sex workers like all the time. Um, uh, and then also like we drafted actually with the clinics some clinic students a like model letter to send to a platform that sort of re deleted your account because there was like sexual content on it. Um, not that that held any particular legal weight, like I, like we don't, there's no like legal claim you can bring, um, but like just in terms of having access to like a draft, a like template letter that's in lawyer language, um, you know, that was something we worked on. I, what I remember about that first meeting is I was really nervous because I was like really worried that like we weren't gonna like, I don't know, it wasn't gonna be useful or whatever, and that I went and bought very fancy donuts because I remember I, the donuts. I wanted to like <laughs> suggest that y'all were worthy of very fancy donuts and that my colleagues in the clinic, including Mason um, and uh, Adam Nagy and other many other wonder, wonderful folks, um, uh, like helped me carry all the coffee equipment upstairs because I like felt very strongly that it should be like hospitable. I don't know, like that you, you can take like, uh, you know, my relationship to my Judaism is uh, questionable at best, but like the Jewish mother instinct that like, I will make sure you get the appropriate fancy food is like strong, right? Um, so yeah, and then I think one of the things that we worked on from there actually was something that came to fruition like yesterday, uh, which was, you know, as I started prepping for this conversation, because one of the things I also wanted to do was talk a little bit about, about the legal context of FOSTA, again, because that's like where I kind of felt comfortable. I sort of realized that like nobody had really written a ton on it and it wasn't really clear what it did. So I sort of did some analysis, but was also like, this is vastly incomplete. Um, and we ended up along with uh, hacking hustling comrade, uh, Laura Lai Lee, um, sort of working with the Cornell Gender Justice Clinic um, to sort of produce this very long form guide. And it, every time we thought we were done, it like grew three sizes. So it's 87 pages. It's on SRSRM. I tweeted it yesterday. Um, and uh, that, you know, it's not, I think it, in some ways it's not a great example of movement lawyering because um, it's like not, you know, it's not really community aimed. But on the other hand, it is in response to a need that we sort of identified together, which was the lack of ability to really understand what FOSTA was doing and to be able to point people to things. And I, I also want to backtrack just a little bit about framing that like as an act of movement lawyering, because it was meeting, addressing the needs of the community. I think better preparing other lawyers to have the conversation. It was impossible to find a lawyer um, after FOSTA SESTA was signed into law to give like a know your rights training because no one knew what the law did or no one understood the law. So I think that that did meet a need as well as while like what I think you're not giving yourself credit for there is what we also did was we provided like a brief like a little card that could be handed out to street-based workers who like were interested in knowing what FOSTA SESTA was. There was also like educational components. A few weeks ago, we did like a legal literacy training for sex workers, which I think like wasn't, may not have been directly related to that, um, to that project, but was informed by the work that like you and Lorelai and the folks at Berkman Klein and Cornell had been working on and provided a space for sex working community, or I also encourage lawyers who are interested in learning about how to like present this information in a way that is accessible to community um, to create that space. That's fair. Um, yeah, in some ways like that, I, I do think in some ways it was the analysis we needed to do a lot of the community-based work, even if it isn't directly accessible to community. And I think that's, that's fair. Um, I'm wondering if we want to talk a little bit about the event, um, like the bigger event that we did um, and that process, and then maybe we can sort of uh, migrate towards talking a little bit about how we think about like movement wiring as like a term or to describe what we're talking about or like other lesson lessons we've learned. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's something that, so Something that Hacking Hustling is interested in is moving these conversations about how sex workers utilize technology and the ways that sex workers are harmed by the same technologies that they need to use to survive and stay, stay in touch with community, make money, and to organize and to like fight legislation like FOSTA SESTA and to fight legislation like Earn It, um, that we really want to be, we want to be having these 
conversations primarily by and for community. But something that is also very important to me and to the work that Hacking Hustling does is that these conversations are also being had at spaces who have institutional power. And I think that people who, who like their MO is already operating within those spaces of institutional power often overlook um, how much can come from uh, like attaching movement work to a name. Like there are definitely pros and cons to this, but like if, if my organization collaborates with Berkman Klein or has Berkman Klein's name on something, which we'll talk more about later, um, that then allows the work that we've been doing to be seen as the academy as worthy of putting two years of resources to and then collaborating with Cornell to create the legal document that we needed and served a need of the community. Um, so when I think about programming, I think about it in two ways. It's like, how is this accessible to the community that I'm working with, that I'm a part of? How, and then how can I like encourage, gently encourage people who have institutional power to share it by inviting us into those spaces? Um, I note that Tim in the Q and A has been like, Kendra said they talk about how they screwed up and I haven't heard about that yet. So this is perfect. This is, I'm so glad you asked that Tim because, um, uh, actually, like what Blunt just said about not understanding like how powerful these institutions are as like conveners and legitimizers of uh, work um, was something I didn't understand before I started working with Blunt. Like and for folks who don't know a ton of, about my career, I've been affiliated to Berkman Klein for a very long time, basically since I started doing um, tech policy work. And I think, you know, it, when you do have access to these like very fancy institutions, it's easy to take for granted the legitimacy that they bring to your work or that they're like power, to, the power of that name on your resume. And so I think when I started working with Blunt, I didn't really understand why Hacking Hustling was really so invested in throwing an event at Harvard. Um, and this actually led to a really interesting miscommunication, which I'm going to talk about for a second, um, which was I felt really, I even before I started working with Blunt super formally, I still, I I felt strongly about making sure folks got paid. And I feel way more strongly about that now as anyone who has worked with me knows, um, or has worked with me knows. Um, but I ran into a lot of barriers around getting Hacking Hustling folks paid when we were trying to put on an event at Harvard. And I think, it, and it made me really uncomfortable because I didn't want, I felt weird going to Blunt and saying like, I can't pay you. Because I understand like how important getting money for this kind of work is. And so, like, I think basically what I did was, like, stop responding to email for three weeks uh, out of, like, shame. Um, and then finally, like, I think we finally got on the phone and I was like, look, like, I've tried and I just, like, don't know how to pay you, right? Like, I don't, like, I cannot pay you what this work is worth. And I don't, like, do you want to cancel? And then what, one, do you want to talk about what you said? Yeah. And, and I was, I was trying to, like, parse that and I was like, and because I was like, canceling wasn't on my mind. Like we do, like, first of all, we do this shit for free all the fucking time. And like, that's fucked up. Um, but also I want to like call out that for the first year, Hacking Hustling was 100% funded through like our main organizers direct labor in the sex trades and through a client donation that went through a 501c3. Um, so like I frame sort of all of my work as hustling. So when we were having this conversation about movement lawyering, I'm like, oh, like, like hustling academic institutions to shift their power. I, I can talk about that. Um, and so we actually, since we had that client donation, Hacking Hustling was able to then, which we had done with iBeam as well, is like iBeam um, was able to find like X amount of money and where we felt people should be paid more for their labor, we were able to fill in the rest, which is sort of what we also did with the event that we put on with Berkman Klein. Um, but it wasn't just the access to the financial resources that Harvard has, which they do have. It was just very difficult to um, find them for this purpose. Uh, we were able to pay people through the work that our main organizers were doing in the sex trades and we paid people up fairly well. Um, and it, so I was like, don't worry. <laughs> like we hustle in other spaces too. We got this covered. And um, having this event take place at Harvard 
is something that would get press coverage in a way that it wouldn't normally is something that will bring these ideas and this community's expertise to people who don't normally have access to that. And like, I think there were a few things that like came from that. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk about like a little bit of the internal process of like organizing that and like work, the work with uh, Who's Corner and yeah. what came from it. Yeah, so I think that like through that event, I got introduced to the folks at Who's Corners in any way, which is a, a sex worker focused, street sex workers, homeless and drug user focused mutual aid org out in Western Mass. Um, and, you know, I, like there's some of the stuff that they wanted to talk, they sort of, that, some of the stuff where they needed like not necessarily legal advice, but sort of counseling that had to do with law stuff. Um, and that like we, uh, I ended up working with them on that. And then it turned out that they had this need um, where they really, what they were looking for was like record sealing for a number of their members who had prior felonies or misdemeanors on their records. And that was the thing where actually, I think like, this is the point at which I feel like I like maybe crossed the threshold into like movement lawyer, right? Where I was like, oh, I could learn how to do that. I can find somebody to do that. Like that can't be that, like, not that that can't be that hard because yeah, it's hard work and it's real, but like, the fact that this is not my core area of expertise and like the work that you know I studied in law school doesn't mean that that needs not real and it's not important to like folks I'm in community with and like if the need is real and the work work is important to folks I'm in community with and it's like in my capacity then like that's a thing that I should be doing so that project actually got put on hold because of the pandemic but like we like did have we were working with them to figure out exactly how you were gonna like everything from like who where can we get a photocopier um it, well, like when we're in Holyoke, Mass, like notarizing all this paperwork, right? Like that was like the thing, you know, and I think that that felt really good because this is a community, like uh, Who's Corn is in any way is an amazing group of folks doing really, really fantastic work. And I got to know them because Blunt and Red, who organized the Hacking Hustling event on Thursday, um, Blunt is probably about to hustle by putting their link in the chat and I'm here for it. Um, uh, uh, you know, said, we don't want this to just be sex workers who were primarily online in terms of like who has access to the space. And we want to hear different sets of concerns, different folks, like different uh, views on sex work and surveillance. Um, and they, they knew the Who's Corner folks and Who's Corner folks were able to come because they were paid through the acts of hacking hustling. So I think that's like super important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, and also I think like the, with the work of hacking hustling is also sort of, it's like bridging gaps between communities and institution, bridging gaps between like who is funded for their labor and who is not, like who is speaking um, on behalf of themselves and who's speaking, like I think there's a very big difference between um, like inviting me to have this conversation with you, Kendra, and like then, or like you then telling this as a story, as if like I'm not a person who is oh, yeah. also involved in this work. And like I've seen a lot of and especially like with working with marginalized communities who have like extensive histories of trauma, I've also seen lawyers who take another approach of telling the stories for their clients. And I think that it's like a radically different approach. And what was so important for us in the planning the event at Hacking Hustling and planning events in general is that it's not just representative of the folks who trade sex online. So while a lot of my research is about losing access to online spaces, um, we wanted to make sure that there were street-based workers at this event talking about the ways that they're policed and surveilled on the streets. We thought that it was incredibly important to also have the perspective of our incarcerated comrades and had our my comrade Red uh, yeah. called up Alicia Walker, who I'll also drop the GoFundMe in the link in a second, um, who is an incarcerated survivor of gender-based violence who's currently locked up in Chicago um, and in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. but she was able to call in and i think that was the most moving part of yes. the um of the conference that we put on for me it was like hearing the process that red goes through to like i feel like a lot of people just like maybe like haven't called folks who are incarcerated and like hearing that process or like not knowing if we'd actually be able to get in touch with lily to hear what she wanted to say and what she wanted to share with folks and i think that that was my favorite part and i think like broadening the conception of like what is technology and how does yep. technology affect and impact people was also a very important part of that project 
Yeah. Do we want to talk a little bit about movement wearing as hustling? Um, which yeah. Blunt, Blunt came <laughs> up with before this call and I love it. Uh, so I'm going to let her talk about it for a little and then I can talk about my sort of relation to and reaction to it. Yeah. So when you asked me to have a conversation with you about movement lawyering, I was like, I don't know anything about movement lawyering. And like, I hadn't, like, I also think that this conversation is interesting because it's bringing to light a lot of work that we were both doing internally. And like, I didn't know some of the like fears or hesitations that maybe like you had that you're talking about now. Um, and like, it wasn't, my, like I said, in the beginning, it wasn't my intention to like, to put on this programming at Harvard when I reached out to you. I was literally screaming into a void. You were one of the only people who responded um, in a way that, that made me feel comfortable with engaging with you. And um, I, I thought of all of my work as an act of hustling, whether or not it's like directly my labor in the sex trades and like, like all of my work is currently funded by my like direct labor in the sex trades, all of the, and this was something that I, I believe it was Yamna mentioned on the last call that her work is largely funded through the corporate law that she does. And I'm like, I, oh, I know something about that. I know something about finding like alternate ways of funding work that is traditionally unpaid. And so much of sex worker organizing is unpaid. And my, my work comes out of a space of harm reduction care coordination, which I frame as like hustling fucked up systems that were never meant to make work in the first place for like beautiful people that I care deeply about and like trying to bridge that gap of service for people trying for sex working people who are trying to access healthcare. And so when it moved into more of like a space of tech, I, I saw that bridge that needed to be gap that gap that needed to be bridged as these spaces with institutional support and power. And so I just truly think of movement lawyering as like, how can I hustle lawyers and people with access to uh, institutional power to have the conversations that I want um, them to be having and yeah. encourage them to do that. <laughs> I love, I just want to like note that that frame of like, how do you like serve, how do you like, get these institutions that were never meant to take care of folks to take care of folks better is like one that I really love and I think is really beautiful. And I think it also speaks to like things that I think about in my work. And I think that's like a point of commonality between us. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that like, I think I often make this joke that like Blunt taught me how to hustle and it's totally true. So if any, uh, I know there are some folks on, my, on this call who have benefited from like my like advice about how to get paid and like, uh, I don't know where you are in the I love crowd. teaching people oh. how to hustle. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, I think part of it, like, you know, uh, institutions often make us feel like we should be grateful for whatever we get. And like, I think what I've like learned, um, oops, Anna, uh, what I've learned from working with Blunt is like, just like, no, ask for more, right? Like why, like often our relationship to asking and sort of to pushing and like, is that like a lot of us who have had access to these spaces are afraid because like maybe our access will get taken away or maybe like we'll get someone will get annoyed at us and like for me like I think what I've learned in some of our work together is like that pales in comparison to the harms that our people are experiencing and that like that like the people I care about and who I am in community with are experiencing and so like it's my fucking job to like be able to be like, okay, like, does this make you a little bit uncomfortable when I ask for this thing? Like, I'm sorry, but like actually the people who need it, need it, right? Like, and that was like, I don't think I had that frame or that understanding before I started doing working community because I think that it's really easy, especially as a lawyer who's where you're kind of role constrained. Like the whole point of like certain forms of lawyering is to sort of like put a barrier between you and the client, like to separate you and like, from the client in terms of their emotional needs or their like material needs. Like I think Massachusetts may be just allowed for lawyers to occasionally pay for food for their clients. But like, you know, like like public defender, I have friends who are public defenders and often they can't actually pay for like a sandwich for their client who's really hungry because like that's a violation of the ethical rules. And like that kind of relationality is such a big part of actually being like working together rather than like like 
you know, sort of standing up and telling the trauma story of in order to like, you know, serve some greater political point. And I also think for me, the other thing I'll say about it is like, it's really changed the way I think about scholarship. So, you know, I don't produce a lot of traditional legal scholarship. It's just like not really my bag. And I think part of that is because like, obviously I have opinions, uh, I have plenty of opinions on how things should be. But, you know, in some ways, like many of the subjects I'm most expert on, I'm most interested in doing client work because work for clients or sort of community work, because like that's, you know, what I think about what should happen doesn't feel that meaningful, right? Like, you know, I, I was talking to a staffer, a legislative staffer for a senator about like 230 reform. And they were like, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. Like, you know, like, I don't, I think what I said, like what I said was like the hacking hustling party line of like from our last press release of like, here are the five things that we're thinking about, right? Like, because like Blunt taught me how to hustle. I'm not that much of an idiot, but like, you know, this, the relationship of academics and of lawyers of this idea of like our personal beliefs are what should inform our work rather than like, oh, like actually like, what is, what are the community of folks that I work with like want and need out of this, this like moment from me? Yeah. And I, I'm thinking back to a lot of when there was just like infinite programming and infinite uh, bills about 230, how, um, no one was talking about like the communities that would be impacted about it. Everyone was talking about like platform liability. And I'm like, people are literally dying because of this legislation. They need to be at the front and the center of these conversations and not added on as an afterthought. Like if the work isn't centering the people who are f literally feeling it, like it's like platforms are not people, people are people and we need to like listen to humans um, who are impacted by by these policies. Um, and yeah, and I think there's like this difference, like I'm, I'm thinking of it of like um, movement lawyer, lawyering versus like savior fetishism yeah. um, of like, and like the power, the how different those power dynamics need to be to, so that you're not um, causing harm by telling someone's story as if it's your own um, yeah. that like you as the lawyer then don't like own that story and then like build a brand around that. Yeah. And I think that like part of it is also, I think something, um, Afsana said yesterday about like, who's the expert, right? Like, I think a lot of now having worked with Hacking Hustling and Blunt for a while, like I'm not an expert in very much, right? Like, um, of the stuff we talk about and like, you know, yeah, like I maybe know more about 230 than some of the other folks we talk, we talk to or that like are in our conversations, but like, you know, um, I, I, as even as a lawyer, like as a lawyer have so much to learn about movement work, about organizing, about like sex workers, about like folks lives and where they're at and how I can be helpful. And, you know, I think that's really humbling. But it also, like, I think for as someone who, like, likes to learn new things, like, that it's really, you know, just, like, even since we've been in the pandemic, there's, like, now a group chat that is, like, very, that at times has been very active. Um, and just, like, feeling um, close to and in community with, with folks in terms of being, like, okay, like, this is who I talk to every day, right? Like, and I think we, like, at this point, like, often talk like every day yeah. <laughs> um so you know just thinking about it like less as like oh this is my like this is my movement lawyering work and we're like oh this is like who i talk to who i work right. with you know who hears me like uh who watches me drink too much rosé on zoom and then not finish the book club book you know like that kind of thing <laughs> um, there's another thing i screwed up tim i didn't finish the book club book to be fair nobody else did either um <laughs> But uh, I think you got further than I did. No, I, maybe, but Kate, Kate got further than <laughs> Kate me. Kate finally uh, finished. Uh, um, anyway, yeah. So I wonder, d before we sort of open up for questions, because we're like sort of uh, nearing, uh, we're about more than a little more than halfway through, anything else you want to add? I know we talked a little yeah. bit about your view about sort of like institutional <laughs> versus oh. uh, Frankie has lots to say uh, about this particular matter. Um, uh, I can vamp for a second while uh, you... We're good. He's, okay. The dog is under control. Sorry about that. No, um, it, no he's not. Um, Frankie is also an important part of this movement learning relationship. Um, so I, I'm glad that he's really getting is. his time. Aftercare puppy. Um, 
Yeah, I think one thing that we talk a lot about and that I think that this conversation helped facilitate is that a lawyer who is doing movement work doesn't necessarily represent the institution that they work for or the beliefs of that institution. And like, I remember having a conversation with you about like how important it felt to have like a Harvard affiliation, just like uh, of some of the programming that Hacking Hustling has done and like how that will literally help us get grants to fund the unpaid labor that we're doing. And you were like, that happened because like I put like the internal work that the a movement lawyer is doing within their institution doesn't reflect like the values or the principles of that institution necessarily. And like, so um, like Berkman Klein or Harvard might be happy to like have me on this panel or have like Kendra push to have like this re really radical conference and give us space and a little bit of money. But like I, as an actively sex working woman who's naked on the internet, not gonna get a fellowship from Berkman Klein or from other institutions like that. And I think that that's something that's become really, Frankie is mad. Um, that's something that has like become more and more apparent to me of like, what are the ways that like my privilege allows me to move in and out of these academic spaces and like how can I create a bridge for other folks to come with me and then like what are the barriers that like I may be blind to because of my ability to like sort of like move through those spaces that actually like per like hinder me from like moving forward and I think what I um what I'm also interested in is or like talking about is like Kendra is awesome and a great accomplice and like is consistently inviting me into those spaces in a way that like allows me to have these conversations publicly but also like gives me more options in the work that I do and the choices that I make and like will ideally hopefully eventually end in funding and I think that that like cannot be like I can't overlook that enough of like what it looks like to be invited into a space in a way that isn't just like, which is like valuing my expertise and my experience as well as providing me with opportunities to move further into those spaces without that person. Yeah, I think that's so important because I, I think that what you don't want is the movement lawyer to always end up as the gatekeeper who like, you know, it's like, oh, you only get access to these spaces through me because like, that's not a healthy, that's a really shitty dynamic. Um, and like, you know, like I will have succeeded when like hacking hustling throws a conference at an Ivy League institution and I have literally nothing to do with it. Like that'll be, that'll be, I mean, there, and actually I will have succeeded when we've abolished prisons and when sex workers are criminalized and, you know, lots of other stuff. But like, you know, in terms of short-term movement goals, uh, um, but yeah, so I see Afsana has a had threw a, a question in our in our chat. Um, so I'm going to take that first, and then if folks want to throw, if they have questions for either of us in in the in the Q and A, would really love to hear them, um, or just topics you'd like us to talk more about. That's also uh, that also works. Um, Afsana asks if we could discuss the notion of recruiting and creating more movement layers, and how you've been successful slash unsuccessful at in doing it. Um, it's it's definitely it's a hard question because I actually don't think we've spent a ton of time, well, thinking of, I was gonna say that and that's not true. Um, I think like we, we haven't necessarily explicitly set it as a goal, but I think like I've watched Blunt sort of in work with like bringing law students in to like these conversations. I think one tricky thing I will flag and then I'll let Blunt sort of react as well is that um, there are ways in which my positioning at a technology law clinic is really ideal for the work that we're doing. Um, because, uh, you know, that's consistent often with some of the needs that Hacking Hustling has in terms of subject matter. But often, folks who go into a technology cl clinic are not necessarily always the most motivated by, like, social justice or, like, have the background in, like, sex worker issues. Like, if I worked at a gender justice clinic, um, like the one at Cornell, right, it might be easier for me to attract students who are, like, really invested in doing work that serves sex workers. Um, and sort of ready to do movement lawyering. 
Um, I don't feel, uh, there's many things I love about my current position, but I definitely don't feel like the majority of students I work with, like that's their, their dream is to become a movement layer. So maybe I'm just like pushing them a little bit further towards doing public interest work, even if I'm not sort of being like, being like movement layering, that's the paradigm. Um, I also think I'm still learning how to do it. And so like, there is definitely a like, oh, you can totally teach while you're learning things. Um, but some of the work we do feels really high stakes and I don't want to harm people. And I think for me, that sometimes I think lets me to be, leads me to be more cautious about including folks I don't know super well in it. Because like, I don't, like, I am so grateful for the trust that folks place in me and like the conversations that I get to be a part of. And I wouldn't want to do anything to jeopardize like the people who like trusted me in that way. Blunt, if you have other responses. Oh, you're muted. I'm muted, I'm muted. Um, it's so interesting to me because it's, it's not like um, I was like intentionally seeking out movement lawyers when like Kendra and I began like our working relationship um, that it wasn't like an intentional process so much as like one that evolved, which I think is also re a really interesting framework for like just being in content in contact with community, I think is a helpful way to like push people and like recruit movement lawyers like I think that the folks the like law students who came to the hacking hustling event that we put on at Harvard like would not have gotten that type of education that and like heard the expertise of the communities that they may or may not be working with without that and so then the other thing that I think about is also really important is like we're talking about our relationship of like a sex working person and someone who's working at a like tech law clinic and like I'm currently shadow banned online and at like constant risk of being deplatformed. And when I think about Kendra and my relationship, I think about like what would have happened if I did not have access to Twitter and I could not have asked that question is something that comes up a lot for me. So I think like fighting against bills like Earn It and fighting against bills like FOSTA SESTA, um, because not only does it like cre like it, these laws have killed people and people have died because of these laws and they also um, destabilize movement work and destabilize our ab ability to be present online and speak for ourselves. Um, and so when I, when, I, when I think about this, I think it's like all so related to me of like fighting for things that allows me to have the same access to online spaces as my non-sex working peers do as part of that work because if if these communities disappear from online, how are you going to get in? How are you going to get in touch with them, um, especially in the middle of a pandemic? Um, and I think it's another, it's just another layer that like invisibilizes and like decreases the power of a community when people are like banned from these, from these spaces. Um, and yeah, I think it's just a matter of like inviting community in to educate you. And this is also something that I did as my job at Persist Health Project, which serves sex working people in New York State accessing healthcare. One of my jobs was providing best practice trainings for, um, for doctors and med school students. And we, Hacking Hustling also provides like best practice trainings for, for like people in the academy who are interested in like bettering their like sex worker competency. And I think that that something that came out of that when I was teaching, I've like taught those classes at like all the major New York City teaching hospitals and the, the med students were like, this is this hour and a half is the most that we've ever talked about sex in our entire three years of med school so far. Um, so I just, I thought was a feedback that I found really interesting. Um, I had something I wanted to add, but it's gone. That's fine. Um, Mason, do you want to hop in with a question? Yeah, I was just going to jump in and, you know, once again, ask, uh, you know, anyone who has questions, uh, p please feel free to ask them. But uh, so first of all, thank you. This has just been really incredible and it's really inspiring hearing both of you speak every time I interact with you. Um, uh, one, one question I wanted to dig a little deeper into is, uh, Blunt, you specifically mentioned, you know, bringing in um, different members of the sex working community who have different needs, who are affected in different ways by the same uh, policy changes. Um, and that's something that, you know, I've kind of started to learn about movement lawyering was one of the first things that I, I really became aware of is like, 
communities that often look or are represented as being monolithic from the outside, once you begin interacting with them, are not, and people have different interests, and what may be helpful to one person could be harmful to another. So I was just wondering if the two of you could speak a little bit more about navigating that and the, you know, the experience of making sure that um, the communities you're working with are not reduced to those people who have the most access or the, or the most voice. Yeah, I think um, the work of hacking hustling is, I'm sort of, sort, of, sort of starting to conceptualize it as like three threefold of like tech, tech law policy that affects how we interact with these online spaces, what happens when we lose access to those online spaces, and making sure that we're providing harm reduction resources for our street working comrades um, that we're also like figuring out like what the tech needs of folks who are trading sex on the street are and um, as well as like being in touch with our incarcerated comrades um, and so that's sort of like how I've been conceptualizing the work that we've been doing and I'm always like interested in in learning more and how also like learning more and how to do better and to make sure that I'm not not speaking over other people or I'm not providing that hacking hustling isn't providing resources to people of what we think people should be learning but rather what people actually need and like meeting the needs of community by not assuming them I think that uh makes a ton of sense and the thing I will I want to just add is like Blunt said a lot of nice things about me um which is very kind but I think one thing that like I don't want to lose track of is how amazing hacking hustling is and one is specifically at making sure that we're not just hearing from like the sex workers with the most privilege one of the terms i learned for the first time at the hacking hustling meeting last november oh my god eternity ago right like um it was the term horrorarchy um which is just this idea that like within sex work and sex work adjacent fields and blunt please correct me if i fuck this up um there are like inherent hierarchies about how folks interact um and the uh and that like i didn't know that as and, like when i started working with blunt um but you know to blunt's credit she knew that right and she like had thought about how do we bring in different folks how do we how do we be making sure the hacking hustling isn't just like you know folks talking about sesta fosta online but also serving the needs of like street-based sex workers i also think how you might show up for folks really does vary based on what their needs are obviously i mean that sounds obvious when i say it but just to like be very clear which is that you know if hack hacking hustling might need bill analysis and like that's something i can do but like uh, some of uh, like our street based comrades might need money and that's a step like and that's like they they don't need legal advice they just need money so they can pay rent right like and that like you know like or a letter for their PO officer so yeah, they can right. come speak at Harvard yeah and like you know being willing to show up in different ways and thinking about like you know do like I think if you'd ask me like six years ago, I might be like, well, maybe I'm a little uncomfortable like giving money to these folks I also work with because I'm, this is, is this gonna reduce me to my money? And like, now I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I, like I actually, um, I was on being interviewed for something of where it was for a nonprofit and they asked me like, they were like, we want to be one of your the primary places you donate. And in all seriousness to the folks of nonprofits, I was like, actually, I don't really give to many nonprofits anymore. Most of my giving is to sex worker mutual aid funds. And they just kind of like looked at me and I was like, oh, like, is that not like, and that now just feels like a natural extension of like this work um, and being in community with folks that's showing up for them, right? Like, and that can mean bill analysis and that can also mean money. Um, and so yeah. I, that's, that it feels important to me. And I, I think something that was very interesting about the work that Hacking Hustling has done is, we've, we conduct like very casual like needs assessments before putting on programming to sort of assess that like what we think folks need is accurate and if it's not like where do we fill in the gaps as well as when we were conducting our research on FOSTA SESTA which like I also want to point out that the only actual research that exists on the impacts of FOSTA SESTA have been done by sex workers. Um, I think there are two or three reports one which was done by Hacking Hustling but we also which wanted to- Which is incredible. To um, I will throw the link in the-, in the Okay, chat. perfect. Thank you. Um, which when we did the 
the research on hacking hustling, we distributed it primarily online. So that means that it's only accessible to folks who have access to the internet. So we also partnered with Whose Corner Is It Anyways, the, the really amazing um, organization that Kendra was talking about early in Western Mass to do the survey with their community at one of their meetings. And so what I, I learned a lot about that practice because I worked really, um, we hired and paid Naomi to modify the survey so that it was both accessible and accessible to the community using the language that that community uses. Um, and also we added on like 40 questions for them that they were just interested in for grant purposes. Um, so like the question, like we had like the questions that were the same so that we would analyze it and then also then just gave them all of the raw data so that they can do whatever the fuck they want with it. Like that data is theirs to use to like hopefully help them get more money and be used for grants. But what, what's something that's so interesting that came out of that is that folks who are working on the street have no fucking idea what FOSTA SESTA is. What they did say is that they noticed like on their, their small stroll in Western Mass, they noticed like 10 to 15 more street-based workers hanging around and like had heard about FOSTA SESTA from them. Um, so I, I think that it, it helped contextualize the research in a way that FOSTA SESTA like pushes people into unsafer working conditions but people who did not have access to those safer working conditions in the first place didn't know what FOSTA SESTA was. We have three questions in the queue. I'm going to read them out loud for people who are watching this after the fact. First one from Ram. Two, two part question. How can technologists amplify cause and what is your favorite resource about sex work 101 for non sex workers? Is that, sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> yes. Uh, first one was how can technologists amplify cause? So I think what can people with access to a technical expertise or technical platforms do to amplify uh, causes they support? And then what is your favorite resource about sex work 101 for non sex workers? Sure, I think um, Melissa Gira Grant's Playing the Whore is an excellent book, as well as Revolting Prostitutes are the two books that I would recommend diving into first. I would also suggest following sex workers and sex worker organizations online um, to like see what, what they're talking about and like being in like internet space community with folks because I think often our like social media followings are so siloed that we don't see, see this. Um, and like don't see how the communities who are directly impacted are responding. And also because the platform is literally erasing people from it is also part of the problem. So being intentional about making sure that you're seeing community responses too. Can I just add something to that one? Is that okay? Um, so I think that one like, uh, Ram, you asked, uh, how to can technologies amplify this cause? And I think like there are maybe like two things I want to flag. Like one is sort of like, I think one of the lessons I've learned as a lawyer in this space is actually letting go of my identity as a lawyer and just being like, what are the other capabilities that I have, right? Like I have a Twitter account with probably mostly followers who are in tech policy. I have access to institutional spaces, right? Like literally uh, uh, physical spaces at Harvard, in non-pandemic times and Zoom spaces at Harvard in pandemic times, um, or, uh, you know, other uh, access to other kinds of other kinds of resources. Um, and I think that like part, like one question I would ask first is, how do I let go of my professional identity in doing this work and just show up as a person who wants to help? Um, and then I think it can be helpful to also, as you sort of get to understand people's experience better through doing the one-on-one -on -one work and through showing up as a person, then think about, okay, how can I show up as a technologist? Like what's going on there, right? So I think that that's, that feels like a sort of part of the answer to me as well. Blunt, you yeah. wanna No, add I'm just that? echoing that. It's like when so many sex workers are shadow banned, like Melissa Jira Grant was trying to at me in something the other day and couldn't find me because I'm name suggestion banned. So she literally couldn't find my account to tag in a post and like with the Berkman Klein I'm not tagged in any of those posts I'm not sure if it was just for typing my name or if because people literally couldn't find my name to at um, so I think thinking about how sex workers 
do not have access to these same tools that people take for granted, like both academic uh, like power as well as the ability to be seen on social media is part of that. Um, I see a, someone's asking a question, which I feel like is somewhat related. Can you address how platforms, especially payment processors, fear of processing money related to sex work affect these um, direct giving efforts. And I'm going to drop a link right here that we put together on account shutdowns and a harm reduction guide, which I think is interesting and helpful um, uh, about like understanding internally the way that this like oftentimes like network shutdown of sex worker financial processes happen. Um, and right now Hacking Hustling is conducting research on um, content moderation and in response to like the police uprisings against uh, the police violence against black folks, um, as well as like the intersection between sex worker and activists, because a lot of activism is actually funded by folks direct labor in the sex trades because it is oftentimes unpaid labor. Um, and one thing that we're finding, one of the common themes is how sex workers losing access to financial technologies um, disrupts movement work is one thing that we're focusing on and our ability to provide mutual aid to each other especially in a pandemic where we're not allowed to just we're not we're not as able to just hand people cash which is how we paid people at the first hacking hustling event was just handing people cash before they spoke which felt very important because sex workers always get paid before rendering a service ideally um is none of us have access to the same financial technologies it's really difficult to move money in a community when every like i've lost access to like three or four different financial services and when we were paying folks for the hacking hustling event it was like coming out of like my my personal account and then being reimbursed but like um because i had to use like four different payment processors in order to be able to provide everyone with stipends um that yeah, I think people just also overlook how impactful it can be to provide someone with money who needs money to give them that money. Like that is a hugely radical act that is very effective. <laughs> yeah, and I think the other thing I'll say there is, you know, my experience on the, from, of some of this from the Harvard side is the uh, institutions often have no ability to meaningfully assess risks to folks when they're paying them. Um, so like, you know, the wallet name that you have that you need to get paid under may be very different than the name you organize under or appear under as a sex worker. And so if you appear at an institution and like they give you an honorarium, but it has to go to the wallet name rather than the name you work under, even though the name you work under is the name you spoke under, that's like a point of connection between two identities that you may not want connected as a sex worker. And like oftentimes, you know, sometimes as like as someone who works at the institution part of my job is like trying to navigate that right like being like okay like blank can i talk about the case western thing okay uh um so like we were on a panel together with case west at case western and like they were like oh like we want to pay you which was great um uh, but then it was like, oh, like, we need you to fill out this W-9 or whatever. And like, it's all this personal information that Blunt didn't necessarily want to give. So anyway, like, what we, what we did was like, they were like, it was like, just pay Kendra and Kendra will pass along the money, right? And like, that worked because like, we have a pretty close relationship where that was something that, like, I think we both thought that was going to work fine in terms of trust. But like, that's like, you know, some institutions would definitely not do that, right? Um, and the, um, and like to your point to Brianna's question about sort of uh, like the way in which account shutdowns and financial shutdowns affect folks like you know um, I think institutions often take for granted access to financial infrastructure whether it's like certain kinds of bank accounts under whichever name or uh, Venmo or PayPal or even if it's stuff like paying folks like two months after an event right like or reimbursing people like that's something that um, institutions often take for granted and people don't have a lot of space to be like this is not cool and this doesn't work for me and yeah yeah no truly it's something I think that 
everyone in academia could learn is to pay people before they render a service. It's just like mind boggling to me that this is not common practice. But like asking a, like a marginalized community member for uh, legally revealing information about them without understanding how that could like expose them to potential harm, um, I think it's something that definitely needs to be considered as well as like how quickly are they getting those funds? Like I'll, I will often pay people either before or like right after something ends with a direct transfer that lands like directly in their account so they have access to that money the same day or like the next day when it when it is processed. And um, when I have had to postpone events, I have offered to pay people upfront when the event was supposed to occur in case people were relying on that payment to get through the month. Um, yeah, so I know we're at 2 p.m. and I see there's a couple of questions left, but um, just, I guess, want to um, sort of wrap up by one, are there any other like thoughts you want to share um, or things you want to say? Um, I mean, I'm just really excited to, for the opportunity to have this conversation and sort of reflect on our relationship because I feel like we were both doing a lot of like invisible work or like work that also I wasn't super aware that I was <laughs> that I was doing just by like I like it being radical of just asking for access to the, to these spaces I was just like I'm just <laughs> like trying to bridge bridge these gaps so it's really interesting to sort of like deconstruct like the power dynamics in our relationship as well as like what we've like both learned from working with each other so thank you for taking the time to no. invite me here to have this conversation um the best way for to ever have conversations is by force in front of a whole bunch of Zoom attendees. No, um, I just, the feeling is so mutual. Um, you know, I think, I hope it's clear to everyone attending and I actually say this all the time, how much I've learned from working with one, how grateful I am to like be in community with her and like the many other folks we work with. Um, and that I, you know, I hope, like I think movement lawyering can feel kind of abstract. And I think for me, I guess like the takeaway I would just offer is that it felt so natural. Like that, like obviously I'm gonna learn a ton. And obviously if I'm working with sex workers and like their lives and livelihoods and community is on the line, they're calling the shots. And you know, obviously I need to let go of some of my own ego around this stuff and like get over it, right? Like, and I think that you know, in some ways, like I, as Blunt said, right, movement lawyering is a framework I came to apply after the fact to the things that I was already doing, because they were what felt right in the time and felt responsive to the needs of the folks that, like, to the needs of our relationship and the folks we work with. And so, you know, as y'all go out into doing your work, um, whether it's movement lawyering or other kinds of movement work, like, I, I wish you some of the same ease, I guess, of, like, finding folks who you click with and who you can, like, grow together with. Um, Mason, I know we need to mention our sponsors, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, and again, let me just echo, thank you, both of you, uh, for giving us so much to think about and to bring back to our work. I want to also just say thank you to Asana and Yumna for their amazing presentation yesterday. I think between the two days, uh, we have stuff that we can take back and reflect on and hopefully uh, really improve the way we all do our own tasks. Uh, apologies to those uh, questions that we didn't get to, um, and thank you to all the attendees uh, for coming. Uh, and finally, thank you to our sponsors, to the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society for providing the infrastructure to have this talk, and to the Office of Clinical and Pro Bono Programs for uh, helping us make sure that our panelists get paid. Um, and uh, Also to ASL19 and to Afsana for making the pretty graphics and posting. Yes, them. yes, that was, uh, the Afsana did a great job with the uh, promotional materials as well. Um, all right, thank you everyone and we will see you next time.